The big question that a lot of people who are interested in not too much working on the backend side is that do you really need a Firebase service in 2023? Now that's a big statement and a big question that requires a lot of insight that I'm, I will be sharing you. Insight from the perspective of a startup world, insight from the perspective of a teaching world, and a lot is going to come in. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here, back again with another video. And in this video, I'll be discussing about do you really need Firebase in 2023? And do you have other alternatives? What are the other pros and cons of these other alternatives? And what are the pros and cons of working with Firebase? So let's get started. So this is a time early in like 2013-ish or 12 late or 13. So it's almost like 10 year or a little bit more. Then at that time, I was still teaching a lot of people about the iOS development and Android development and whatnot, the core syntax. And we had a couple of options in those tutorials on the boot camps. We didn't want it that our students gets into a lot of debate about how to build their backend because backend is altogether a different subject and you require a different expertise into that. And we obviously wanted to teach them about the login flow, how things actually are being sent to the database, how the response comes from the database. There's a lot of learning curve in that. And during that time, we had two easy options to work on with that. The two options that we had in front of us was Parse, which was supported by or backed by Facebook. And another option was Firebase. And one day, Facebook just randomly woke up from the other side of the bed and said, hey, we no longer want to put our resources into the development of Parse. So we are open sourcing it, but not just open sourcing it for the greater good of the world, just like they did with the React, but they kind of abandoned the project and made it open source and said, hey, you do whatever you like to do. And eventually people realized that it's no longer a super actively maintained project and we have to do things on our own. And suddenly people were moving into the world of Firebase. And Firebase for a long run had a monopoly into the entire backend as a service, entire game of the backend as a service. Now, Firebase started very actively and smartly. They just moved into the tutorial world first and tried to have a lot of tutorials on the web. And now, obviously, these students who learned from this moved into the world of startups and the big businesses, and they start using it. And Firebase was all free. Not everything is free on the world of internet. Now, Firebase is good service. I'm not against into it, but they use something known as, or they rely on something known as vendor lock-in. So let's just say you have built your startup or your new product and you want to, you're very afraid that I don't want to pay any bill right now. I don't want even to pay $1 or $5 or $10 a month for my bill. So Firebase came up with this very lucrative free model in which you just build your platform and softwares on the front end side will give you the entire back end and just keep on building. And after that, they start charge you and that charge is really, really high. But you cannot just move away because you have written so much of the code in the Firebase and you don't have control. If suddenly you need more features or maybe more rate limiting control or something, it's not easy to go in that. It's not an open source project. It's logged in behind the Google's wall. And thus for a long time, we have seen that this is the situation. Like for example, if you go into the pricing, you want to use the no cost plan, which is Spark, but you want to use the functions or the cloud functions. It's not available to you. You have to go in. Yes, you get a lot of good free ones, but you have to pay a minimum, which is the pay as you go plan, but it's a blaze plan. It requires your credit card and all these stuffs. So for a long time, we have seen that there is, has been a dominance. And on top of that, do you really need these, this much of the services from the Firebase? Maybe you're just looking for an authentication, a backend, few cloud functions, maybe some real time data. That's, that's all you need. So world saw this as an opportunity that, Hey, there's a lot of things going on and probably potentially there could be an alternative to Firebase. For so long, we didn't have. But now we have a lot of alternatives of open source. And in fact, there are a lot of them which we can talk about. But in today's video, I have kept specifically the talk for one of the one which I have been using for a lot these days for a client work, for a startup world as well, and as well for teaching students a lot of things as well. And that is known as AppRite. Now, AppRite uh, recently changed their entire thing into a new marvelous looking uh, UI as well, which I'll show you and share you. It's not just a UI change. It's now more fine grained control as well as more stats about what's happening about your backend as, as well as your app. And the best part is it's an open source. 
Now, when you look into the open source uh, side of this app, right, you're going to realize it, it looks a fairly uh, well-talked project, but not that much. All the 27.9K stars on a project is pretty heavy, but not that heavy as compared to other projects. And the reason for that is nobody is actually coming up onto the GitHub of uh, the app, right? They all are actually going into their Docker segment. And that's why on the Docker side of it, you see that they are having a pull of 5 million plus. Yes, everybody loves to use AppRite through the Docker containerization way. And in fact, if you want to use the AppRite, you can just click on this and just see that it is super easy to work on that. So a lot of people actually go up here and this AppRite is available as a droplet service onto DigitalOcean. So technically you can spin up just $5 or $10 machine and can use AppRite as a backend as a service open source, you can modify it as much as you like, no vendor lock-in, and no services behind the paywall, use it as much as much as you like. And at first you, you think like that it's going to be lots of bills that app that Firebase is handling because it's Google, but no, it's not that much bill. We have seen with the number of requests and everything comes up, we have never shot up about $10 or $15 a month, that too of an app which is having like uh, over uh, like 100,000 of the people using that app. So it's really, really cheap at that time. Now, one more thing which I absolutely like about the app, right, is the documentation. So let me walk you through with that. So if you go up here onto the Firebase and you move into the doc section, there are fundamentals and they're built. So this is the revamped version of it. When you go into the fundamentals, you see that how you want to get started with Firebase, maybe you want to add an app or a game or something like that. So you have to first pick up that I want to use maybe in React Native or something. I have to come up here. Now this is comparatively way better off the documentation what it used to be, but still the style of documentation, it's very much dated. It is like almost 2015-ish or kind of a documentation. We have way better style of documentation now. And now let me compare to a documentation which comes up from the community because of the open source. You go into the app, right? And you look at the docs here. And what do you want to do? Maybe you want to create an account or maybe you want to install it for the web. And you just come up here and that's it. That's all you have to do. This is not very impressive. This part is impressive. You get all these code snippets where you have to just change the endpoint and the project ID and that's all you have to do. Let me show you one more example which is going to 100% impress you. You click on account. Look at the navigation, how easy it. I clicked on account because I wanted to work something on the auth. I want to create an email session. I click on this. I get this source code. I can copy and paste it. And all these variables that are there, for example, there is this and this password. So it says you need to pass me a string, which I'll consider as an email, a password, which I'll consider as a string, but must be at least eight characters. And that's it. What I'll get you back is a session object. You can just click on it and can read about what the session object is going to look like and what's the data type of it. That is how the documentation should be, at least in this year. And that's what they are doing. Now, one more thing I would like to mention here that let's just say you want to use uh, something like a localization or a function, let's just say. I click on the function. I want to say that I want to use a code execution function. So they just clearly mention what's going to happen here. For example, that this endpoint is limited to 60 requests in every one minute per IP address. So already they have mentioned a security layer that what is your rate limiting and everything that they are mentioning here. And since the open source project, whenever you want, you can go ahead and change it. And if you want to start writing your functions or something, that's all you have to do. The function ID and everything. There's a nice tutorial and everything. Now comes up onto another point that, hey, even if I don't want to spend a $5 on the digital ocean, do you still recommend services like AppRite? Yes, 100%. If you are a startup, just apply for Azure credits or AWS credits and in that spin up an instance and just install AppRite directly into it. You have free access, so you never have to worry about the backend. So this is a big question right now in front of us that do we really need or want to continue with the monopoly of Firebase or do we have open source alternative which are community driven? And that's why you see, I'm 100% sure the documentation that you see up here on the AppRite was not there on the day one. In fact, I saw it. But as the community work comes into that, the community decide that this is much easier of a documentation and more such thing. So you can go ahead and work on with that. Now, 
On top of this, this is all driven through Docker as well. Now you can install it as a standalone app in case you want to, but Docker is something that I would love to go for that. So in the next video, I'll walk you through that how you can just go ahead and install the Docker. In the next couple of videos, I'll walk you through that how the Docker can help you to install it as well as how you can configure it. And then one by one, we're going to have a deep dive discussion about the app, right? That how you can utilize it to create some accounts, uh, interact with the database. And then we're going to move forward in creating a full-fledged application whose backend we are not going to write. It's going to be fully dumped onto the app, right? A great way to start learning these open source projects. If you're interested in such things, in an in-depth discussion about what is happening, the mindset behind it, as well as some tutorials, subscribe to the channel and let's catch up in the next video where we are going to learn absolutely from the fresh and the scratch of using the app right. Let's catch up in the next video.